All right, Paul, what's up? How's your day going? Uh, really good, really good. I'm glad to be on here with you. Yeah, I'm super excited for my audience to be able to hear from you because you are one of the most well-reputed experts in the hypertrophy space and also a friend, and you're also such a good writer. And one of my favorite things about you is how you are no BS. It's like straight to the point. Like Paul will tell you what works, what doesn't. <laughs> He's not going to joke around and just try to sound smart. He's like, let's get straight to it. So through all your, through all your writing, through all your like T Nation, Flex Magazine, all, even on social media, I mean, writing is definitely your strong suit. Like, I feel like people get to know you pretty well, but what's something that they might not know about you in regards to what brought you to this place in the industry? Well, I mean, depending on how long they've been following me, that's, that's kind of a unique question, right? Because it's really weird. Every once in a while, somebody will pop up and I realize they've been almost following me since the inception of me arriving. Um, mm. in, industry to some degree. But uh, one of the things that comes up pretty often that people don't know about me is that I actually spent 15 years being a computer engineer. Um, <laughs> and that was actually, you see, you didn't even know. I that. know, I would have never thought that. So, actually a computer engineer and a lot of people, one of the common questions is, is how do I, how do I do what you do? And how did you do what you do? And I'd made a post a couple of weeks ago about how basically I don't have any certifications. I have a ninth grade education. Um, and I went to school in high school. I went to school one day of 10th grade. I was like, this shit is not for me. And I left. <laughs> went back to school again. So um, I guess from that standpoint, one of the things I like to give hope to people is that, um, is that no matter where you're kind of sitting at in your life right now, um, and this is not a, you know, you can do anything you want to do because you really can't. I can never be an NBA player. But if there's something you have a significant degree of passion about and you're really unhappy in what you're doing, there's there's probably something that you can be really amazing at that you may not even know about yet. I didn't know that I was going to be really good at writing until I started writing. And sometimes we, we're our own worst enemies about boxing ourselves in and limiting our space as to what it is that we can excel at in life. So I was a computer engineer. Um, I graduated top of my class out of the military and became a computer engineer uh, for the intelligence squadron. And then got out of the military and kept doing that as a civilian. Um, and I was really great at my job. I was, I will, I've, I've usually been pretty good at whatever it is that I put my, my mind to that I wanted to do. But it definitely wasn't waking up every day and living my passion. I wasn't unhappy. And when I started writing, I realized, man, I really like this writing thing. This is, this is where my jam is at. And so I started writing on a blog. And um, I was friends with a guy that was the senior editor uh, at a, a major uh, website, a powerlifting website. Time it was Elite FTS. The guy by the name of Jim Wendler. And Jim's like, "Let me see what you're writing." And so um, I, I sent him like my articles, and he's like, "Dude, this is phenomenal." He's like, "Would you? Could we publish some of these?" And I'm like, "No." This is a really funny thing now because almost everyone is trying to get visibility in the, like the industry in some way. And I was literally saying no to it. I was like, no, I don't no, Don't. Cause I didn't want, it's a scary thing to put your writing out there. It really too. Cause you're going to be criticized. You're going to be judged and all that kind of stuff. And you, you have to be, you have to kind of step into that space and like, okay, I'm going to own this and whatever comes at me. Mm -hmm. um, becoming acclimated to that environment is tough. I mean, I've taken a beating over the years for, for things, because as you said, I can be very, um, heavy handed in my opinions. Mm -hmm. I get that. I'm a very, um, sometimes people even take it the wrong way. Like, dude, I'm, I'm not being confrontational on the net, but the way that I write can cross that way sometimes. So that was something that I had to get acclimated to. It was basically the internet talking shit on you. And I'm like, why do all these people that I don't even know, like care so much about what I'm doing in my life or writing about? So it's a really weird space to, to live inside of sometimes. But um, yeah, I was a computer engineer, made the transition over when I actually started making a side business out of everything to do with that. Uh, and then eventually transitioned out of that um, into doing this full time. And now I get up every day and I'm lazy. Okay. Okay. Well, there's just so much treasure in what you just said. Okay. So let's back up first to when you dropped out of school after the first day of 10th grade, because if, if you guys aren't familiar with Paul, if you're in bodybuilding or hypertrophy or muscle growth, like you, I'm sure you know who Paul is, but if you aren't, if Paul is new to you right now, Paul is revered as one of the most intelligent in the hypertrophy space. He is the guy that the guy goes to, to yeah, learn. Huh? Good thing on you ass. <laughs> okay. Well, in my realm of what I, in your, like your post, I'm like, wow, that's really freaking smart. Wow. Okay. Got it. And what I love about that though, is that, and you're clearly, 
clearly intelligent. If you follow Paul's p- post, like you can, there's a lot of intelligence there. And what's cool about it is you're like proving and showing that plugging into the matrix and going through the system and doing the, the, all the things. Cause I was, I was actually the opposite. I was like the honor society president and like super academic and, you know, graduated top of my class. Um, but I actually had to let go of all of that stuff because I found that being plugged into the system like that was actually limiting me from what you're saying. Like I had to let all of that go of like my ego being wrapped up into, I thrive really well in this system and saying, hold on a second. What do I love? What do I actually want to do? What am I good at effortlessly? And that's the second part of what you said is, um, there's a Japanese concept called Ikigai and we talked about it not too long ago. And it's, it's finding what your purpose is. It's what are you good at? What can you be paid for? What does the world need? Right. And what you're doing is showing like, you're like, I'm really freaking good at writing. And I saw that in you. I, I'll stop because I want to hear more from you. But I, I will say like, I was out visiting Paul recently. You whipped up a post in like 10 seconds. I was like, wow, this is really good. You wrote that. In, when did you write that? So you're super good at it. Yeah, that, that's funny is that you were out here for like uh, four days. And I didn't even know I only had a ninth grade education. Like there's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things. Okay, We talked about a lot of stuff. But uh, there's, there's, there's like, there's, yeah, there ends up being a lot of things. That's what you asked is like, tell people something they don't know about you. You didn't know that I did computer engineering. You didn't know I had an accurate education. Um, yeah, I think what you said there is really key. And I'll give you an example of that is talking about you can, you can read and study and take tests and you can do all that stuff. But a lot of times, um, and I think that was me and you, and this is just a really cool thing. We, I talked to you about the, um, this is a really great, great example of that of something that we did uh, together is when we were, when we were driving, um, I was talking about the song black by Pearl Jam. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. And I said, I heard that song a million times and it's about, uh, under, uh, unreciprocated love, right. Under uh, unrequited love, right. It's, it's, right. Being, it's loving somebody and the relationship going bad and not feeling love back. And I said, I went through my whole teenage years when I was in my teenage years, the, um, that album, I think it was 10, right. 10 by Pearl Jam. That's the album. It's like that yeah. song was like super popular i heard that song literally probably ten thousand times in my life totally so i went through this really heartbreaking relationship that just broke me down to like you know like bare bones i had to look up to see rock like bottom emotionally with how like that's i heard that song and it hit me everything he wrote about i had this sudden sense of identification with and despite the fact that i had knew those lyrics like the back of my hand mm-hmm. until I had something that gave me context about that. I didn't really grasp the meaning behind it, right? Mm -hmm. That can be applied across the full spectrum of everything you're ever going to know in life, right there. And that's something. So like until we have an identification process that gives us context and association, that we don't understand the, the full depthness of some of the things that we think we know. Exactly. That's why, like, I always say, whenever my clients ask me questions that I don't have an answer to, I look at it as a gift because it's such a heightened way to learn versus going to college, taking a test about hypothyroidism. Let me memorize, okay, selenium, iodine. But but when I have an actual client going through that and I need to learn that way, that's such a more powerful way to learn because it matters to me. And like, it's kind of cool because you and I are both coming from, you know, I was like very much like, I will thrive in the system and I will be an academic superstar. And you were like, forget this crap. And look, we came to the same place because of our passions and our interests and what we're good at and what showed up for us. So just like that song, like for us, it was like the learning got enhanced because of our passion and you, another thing I'll say real quick, we'll get into it guys. Don't worry. We'll get into like nutrition and training and all that stuff. But another thing that's awesome about you that I noticed um, when I was out there is that you in conversation are impeccable with your word as Don Miguel Ruiz puts it. You are very careful with the words that you use in conversation and you can see in a, that reflects in your writing, but you can see that you're passionate about that. You're like, hold on, let me pick the right word. Right. So that's, it's just, it's, it's something you love and are good at and you're doing that. It's just so cool. I think we can all learn a lesson from that. Yeah, and I just did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with a really prolific writer, Jack Donovan. We had that conversation of how important words are. I really don't think people understand just like the importance of how you speak, the ruminations that you have in your head with your internal dialogue, that the words you're using with that really shape your belief system and your perception about the life that you're living in right now at this moment. Mm-hmm. And really careful. Uh, one of the times uh, that I went through therapy, it's totally not a shame that I talked about that too, is that mm-hmm. my, um, my therapist at the time pointed out that I used a lot of absolutes when I talk. 
And when you use absolutes, it creates this framework for really boxing you into situations mm-hmm. emotionally. And for example, like my wife screams at me all the time. Well, does she really scream at you all the time? Mm-hmm. So it causes you to challenge those particular situations. But we live inside of those particular frameworks that we create because our language, the way we speak and the way we have internal dialogue with ourselves actually creates our perceptions. So if you want to start changing your perceptions about yourself and about the world, the first thing that you actually have to change is the language that you use, both when you speak and then both how you talk to yourself. And those are just such huge things. And I don't think people often grasp the power that they have in order to change how they view themselves and how they view their relationships and how they view their life. Everything about that really just starts with your language. And it is the most one of the most powerful things that you have, if, if not potentially the most powerful thing that you have, because when you're, your language, you know, you can end a relationship with your language or you can you know, start a romance with your language or you can you get a job because of the language you use in, uh, you know, in a job interview. Um, you know, you can your language is one of the most powerful things that you have. So how you speak, the words that you use are so vitally important each day. The words that you speak to yourself and the words that you use to engage with another person are so vitally important um, because of the power behind them, the mechanisms um, that they create and everything that falls, you know, in after that. So So that's real to me, like the, when I talk and I'll say something and I had a girlfriend one time and early on when her and I were dating, I would correct myself when I was talking. I was like, that's not the word I want to use. And she thought I was actually manipulating the conversation Mm -hmm. later when she actually read through some of the stuff that I read about how you're supposed to talk and stuff, she actually realized I was trying to speak to her in a more healthy way, more connected way. Mm -hmm. When you're used to working from a source of dysfunction and you find somebody speaking in a very different way than you do, you can say, what is this person trying to do in this moment? It's just because you haven't learned how to speak in a particular way where you can articulate your needs and where you can, where you're trying to offer connection to somebody and that is what we have the power of words to do is we offer connect, better connection to ourselves and create better mm-hmm. stories for ourselves and then create better stories for the person that we're talking to and then give ourselves a, a chance at better outcomes in life on a multitude of fronts. So, yeah, I'm, I tend to be very careful because I'm, I, I believe that I'm pretty cognizant about the power and authority that we have in our life with words, how we're speaking, what those words mean to us and what they're going to mean to another person. Yeah, absolutely. Man, that is powerful. That, that right there. I mean, if we could all be a little more self-aware with our words that we're saying in our heads and to others, like think how much the world could change. That's 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 powerful thoughts because we we like to be up in our heads. <laughs> we're always all up in our heads, but are we filtering? Are we careful with like, are we intentional about what's going on in there and then what's reflecting out? Um, how do you think, you know, I have to say one other thing I, I notice is I, I don't know if it's just your personality or if it's your Southern side or what, but you're super honest, right? Like that. And I've noticed like, and since I've gotten to know you, you're just flat out. There's no BS. You're like, this is how I feel. This is what I think. And because you combine that honesty with being intentional about your words, I've noticed how that reflects in your writing. I think that is why you are so able to effortlessly roll out this very easy to consume content, which honestly, like if anybody's doing social media influencing, like go follow Paul so you can see what I mean. And you just rattle that stuff off. It's not like you don't sit there for an hour and revise it. And like, you're just rattling it out. And I think it's your honesty that brings you there. Yeah. (laughs) Somebody read something from it. Just that's the only draft. There's no, there's no, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it just comes out. Um, first of all, thank you. That's such a, a wonderful compliment. Um, I appreciate that. Like that was, um, that was always what I, one of the things I considered, considered a strong suit about my character for the longest time is number one, my ability to forgive. And the second one was um, just being honest. It, all depending, like I said, that could come across as inflammatory. So mm-hmm. I want, I've had to, um, try to refine over the oh you can be inflammatory for sure (laughs) but i've actually i'm far more refined than i used to be um one of the ways um and you got to meet my girls uh when you were here uh, and they loved you and but one of the ways that i learned how to really connect with my girls again was was refining that honesty and then just being a better connector through listening and stuff like that so um I one of the I remember reading uh, like a couple of years ago that if you one of the one of the aspects of actually cultivating a healthy relationship with people like friendships relationships that kind of stuff is that you have to be willing to hurt the other person's feelings through mm-hmm. honesty. Um, and one of the you, wow. you, talk, you and I talked about this concept when you're here a lot is always you know standing and stepping into your power into your truth and living in those places. I and mean, when you are dishonest with people um, about 
either how you feel about them or how you feel about yourself or those kind of stuff. That is, that's another catalyst for creating dysfunction in your life in those particular relationships that you hold. So you have to, that's one of the things about standing in your power, stepping into your truth each day is that actual, that phrase is stepping into your truth. It's constantly living within that truth. Now, how you're going to deliver the truth is going to have an impact too. Mm -hmm. But within, you will go to bed and sleep much better every night if you consistently are honest with people and do your best in the exchange of, of that, of that honesty to just at least open softly and deliver it in a way that you feel is connective. Even, um, even if you know, like, Hey, it's going to end this relationship, or I know this is going to hurt that person's feelings. Um, we had a funny one, right? Like there's some things that I had this conversation last night with my friend, but there's some things that, um, that you just, there's no way you can deliver softly. Like, <laughs> Your energy is so high at times. And I'm like, like, I'm pretty steady all the time. Like this right here, this is my ten. I'm like, I can't say tar. Can you bring it down too freaking much? It's like, and I'm like, is there any way to deliver that? I looked at you, I was like, is there any way to deliver that? That's not going to hurt. She's like, and you're like, no, there's not. I'm like, okay, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I appreciate that. I was like, oh, I had no idea. So yeah, and that's it's not a comfortable conversation to have, but it's so important. Right. It brought us closer together, not further apart. And that's what we think is if I'm honest and I tell them this, it's gonna push them away or it's gonna hurt them. But I was like, oh, if you at least especially if you can get two self-aware people together that can take honest feedback from another person, then you can come closer together, right? And that's a choice on both ends. And I, I do think the other part about that is like your level of respect that you have for the person that's delivering you that particular truth. Because if it's somebody like you're like, hey, okay, they take that, you're like, well, you know what? Like, <laughs> But if it's somebody that you feel, um, you're like, I respect this person. So I know that it's coming from a place of love and like connection. Like there's some things that you just hear. Cause you know, we had, we had some conversation, you said some things, that didn't feel good, but I'm like, I'm open to hearing it because I need to hear these things. And like, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to apply those things because I know it's coming from a place of love and caring about my life too. So I, I often think that, you know, you have to at least be able to build um, that that amount of respect um, for each other first, that degree of mm-hmm. comfort. And then mm-hmm. you can, like, whenever you give somebody something, you're like, well, I know this is coming from a place of love, no matter how much it stings. And um, that's something I think you have to learn through life too. Sometimes when somebody gives you, I read an article a couple of years ago that actually showed through some type of social um, psychological study that our, our, the, the friends that care about us the most are the, actually the ones that criticize us the hardest, the, the harshest. Mm-hmm. And that, that often tends to be true. It's like the people that really want the best for us often call us out on our bullshit. Yeah. Worst friends are the ones that enable your bullshit. Those are actually your worst friends. Like, and you, here's the thing. This is like, I don't even care. Like, I know you have a female audience, but women are the worst about this. And I think you'd probably agree because I, all my friends, my guy mm-hmm. friends call me out of my bullshit. But I had two sisters and I have three dollars. So I do know a little bit about this and how, how females work. And I think you being with me for four days know I have pretty good insights to the feminine mind. And that is, I find that women a lot of times stay stuck in particular cycles of dysfunction because of who they have surrounded themselves with at times and that they don't have good people in their life. They have consistent enablers that enable their shitty bullshit behavior. And I have come across that so much in my life where I'm having a problem, say with somebody I'm dating or whatever. And then they have friends that are like, you don't need that guy. You're a queen, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you're not, wait, like, are you know, like you literally know what she did and you're not saying, you know what? You fucked him over. Mm-hmm. And I've consistently found uh, that women, I think, do a really good job of surrounding themselves with other women who enable their shitty behavior. Whereas, like, I'm, I've done a pretty good job. Uh, and believe it or not, I've got female friends that, are, that do a good job of calling me out on my bullshit behavior. You being one of them. Um, but I have another one, Angelica. She's amazing at calling me out, kicking me in the balls on my bullshit. And I'm so thankful for her in my life. But I've got all my friends do a good job of that. Saying, like, well, you know, you're kind of fucking up here. So... Um, I yeah, think it's it, important to surround yourself with honest people who are willing to connect and give you hard truths, man. That's how you grow. Like someone's got to like put you in those really uncomfortable places where you got to stretch yourself. Yep. And I think like you can, the easy way to find that out is if every time, th- every time you go in victim mode and you just want to bitch and complain about something, you have that one friend that you're going to call because you know that they'll enable you and help you feel right. Watch, yep. watch that, watch that and ask them. Awesome. Are you being honest with me? What do you think? Do you have feedback for me? Because it's like, I've noticed that in myself. I'm like, oh, I want to s- step, s- like, just sink back down into like old, I call one of my friends and I would call it past life behavior, like before we started becoming conscious and doing personal development work when we just want to like gossip or like be like low vibration or whatever. Like, do I, I have my, huh? I 
called you out on a couple of shitty stories that you've been recreating. I'm like, that's a shitty story you got going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. It's so nice. I'm like, it's so nice to have somebody call you out on your blind spots. And I think, you know, if we're strong enough in ourselves, if we're watching our own internal dialogue, we can receive those things like, oh shit, thank you for the feedback. I I didn't realize that. You are right, right? And it doesn't mean you have to accept everything. It's like, go through your inner guidance, your filtration system. Does that feel true? Yeah, that freaking feels true. And I think so so often we don't want to accept that. I think another thing I want to point out is um, establishing this respect and trust. Um, I think part of the reason, because you do, you write stuff that like gets under people's skin sometimes on social. Most of everything you- Anymore, I don't do that as much anymore. Not that much. More. Not that much, but sometimes, you know, and I think the reason your, your audience is so supportive of it is because you, they've been able to see your heart. They know who you are. You've established that respect and trust. They get you, you know what I mean? So I think, um, you know, for anybody who might be wanting to put themselves out there a little bit more in the social media game and fitness or whatever, I think it's so important to show your full self, like show those vulnerable sides, show your heart. Because then when you, you know, I can be intense like that too. Like I like to like punch a little bit sometimes with my posts, but people know my heart. So on Instagram, that comes over really well because they're like, dude, Tara's just like, she's just feeling intense right now. If I try to do that on Facebook, my Facebook audience doesn't know me that well. They're kind of like, uh, <laughs> it's not received as well, right? <laughs> like my Facebook, excuse me, my, I think my Facebook family has literally been with me for like like eight years. Like almost everybody that's on my friends list has been with me for a long time. So it's like <laughs> they've watched the evolution of my whole life over the past mm-hmm. eight years, being married to getting divorced. Uh, to talk about losing the relationship with my kids, to like rebuilding it and all those kind of things. Um, and this is what you talk about is um, I, one of the things I never wanted to be was uh, I never wanted to be called inauthentic or fake. Like that, that shit right. Right, never be. So like I talked about, like I wrote posts about when like I had an affair and I was open about that and wrote about that. I wrote about how I went to therapy, um, you know, like how I tried to, you know, rekindle things in my marriage and just, it just didn't work. And the reason why that I'm open like that is like I said, I don't, I never, you have to accept the fact that if you're going to be thrust in this area of notoriety in some, you know, area like fitness, like it is, is that um, no matter what you give up a certain amount of your privacy to a degree, mm-hmm. like because when something slips out, you allow other people, which are, you know, gossip mongers that they're going to run with it and create stories for you. And I never wanted that to be the case. I was just always like, I was like in Eminem, when you watch eight mile, if you ever seen the movie eight mile and the end when Eminem talks about all the shit they're going to say about. So it's a rap battle. And in the final rap battle, he, to win the rap battle, he actually says all the shit about him that he knows the guy is going to say. And so the guy has nothing to say at that point. Mm -hmm. So we always, I felt like I did a pretty good job of rendering, uh, people quiet after the years um you know we all have things in our life one of my one of my quotes that i came up with i was like we all have things in our life that we wouldn't want put on the front page of the newspaper right and so i i always took mine i was like well i'm not going to let somebody else put it on the front page of the newspaper so i'm going to put it on front page. right <laughs> and it opened up dialogue um for people and that was another part of it that I found over the years that it offered up so much connection to people. We find that, that I've always said this, the way that we find the strongest sense of resonating with another human being is through the source of identification of struggle. And so if I post about, Hey, like when my daughter, my oldest daughter didn't speak to me for three years, you know, after the divorce, I didn't get to go to the wedding. We have a great relationship now. When I wrote about that, I'm not going cry, to cry on your podcast. So um, when I wrote about that, I wrote about that because I know there's somebody else that's either gone through that or is going through that, or maybe mm-hmm. they can later and read it. But I also had hope that I would, um, I am so, I've, hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cry on podcast. You'll be the only person ever crying on podcast. You know, my girls are everything to me. And, uh, but I also had hope that uh, I would be able to, rekindle that at some point and now like me and, and Hannah and my eldest like we we have a great relationship and that is the thing that I'm most proud of in my life is rebuilding that but the reason why that I get that stuff is because I think the majority of us we go through life and we end up with these any significant either betrayals or seasons uh, where life empties us out and makes us feel hollow again mm-hmm. it's hard to think about 
getting back to the precipice of what feels good again and ascending out of that valley um, into a place of full emotional fulfillment in some way. So when you go through these particular seasons, one of the things that is often a source of strength to find out is this person, I know this other person, they went through this and, you know, they felt completely hollowed out um, and felt completely enveloped, um, you know, swallowed up by, you know, this, this source of loss in their life. Um, and, um, one of my favorite, um, um, pieces out of the Bible is when, um, David, um, who was my favorite person in the Bible, we talked about, I think we talked about that, mm -hmm. but he taught it, it's called the dark night of the soul where you can't even hear God's voice anymore. And that always resonated, resonated with me so strongly because David was like my hero in the Bible, right? He was like the man. So when you go through those places and you, you feel like I don't, you wake up every day and, um. I remember I've gone through some times in my life where uh, I had a friend text me who was going through similar stuff. And he's like, do you ever feel like you're just going to wake up one day and feel a sense of happiness? again?" And that man, that was so strong to me at that moment, because I was like, no, like you have those times where you're like the answer. Mm -hmm. No, like mm -hmm. I will wake up again and have this sense of, of just happiness. And it's not okay. Like it's not normal to be happy all the time. That'd be fucked up too. But mm -hmm. When you feel like I'm just not ever going to wake up and not think about the dread that that's standing in front of me for the rest of the day, that I'm just going to have to fight through this wall of emotional tyranny, right? Um, and you, you, it does happen, right? Like you yeah. get, and then all of the worries. Like one of my another of my philosophies is it, it becomes the second thing. Did I ever did I tell you about the concept of the second thing? If we talked about mm -hmm. that. So the concept of the second thing is like, for example, you're going through a breakup or, you know, you're going through financial hardships or whatever it is, that thing that feels so insurmountable to you at that time emotionally is that more often than not, when you wake up in the morning, it's the first thing you think about, right? It's the first thing that's on your mind. You wake up and it's just right, they wake up and you're, it's just right there, right? Mm -hmm. Dog that shit in the living room, like that, like when you wake up and they're in your bedroom, they're just like right there looking at you, <laughs> they shit in the living room. That actually happened to me. But <laughs> um, the second thing is when you wake up and it's it's the second thing you think about. And that's when you know you're starting to kind of ascend out of that valley a little bit. And that, you know, you actually have to take steps to do that. I hate the saying, it's like time heals all wounds. Like, get the fuck out of here with that shit. Time does not heal all the wounds. It's what you're doing with that time that matters. It's what you're doing with that time that you have that's going to help mm -hmm. men those injuries so um that's my concept of the second thing is so vitally important because like am i doing things to help create the transition of that monstrosity in my life to become the second thing yeah wow absolutely dang thanks for sharing your soul right there like i i, I respect that so much i'm actually in like a facebook group for divorced people and somebody i'll never forget it because somebody asked the question hey just curious what resulted in all of your divorces and it was like a hundred victim stories okay it was like at least a nobody nobody in there contributed to their divorce it was always the other person right and it was like it tons of he cheated she cheated he cheated she cheated he cheated he was abusive she was abusive he was abusive she was abusive and i thought where are the people that are saying i was abusive i cheated where are they because apparently there's tons of them. So where are those people? Where are those voices, right? And so thank you for being one of those voices. Oh, 100%. That's why I talked about my affair. And here's the other thing. I got castigated by people. It's like, well, I've been married for like, you're clearly this, not. I'm like, there's always, so when you've been married for 17 years and decide to have an affair and sent 15, 15 or 16 of which were really good. Um, and I loved my wife um, to the bottom of my heart like with all my soul during that time. I was completely faithful for those like 17 years. When you're faithful for 17 fucking years and decide you're going to have, there's a lot of shit that happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the great thing mm -hmm. about it is my and her relationship now is she takes so much responsibility for how we got there and that I, how I ended up in a place where I'm like, this is the decision that I'm going to make. And one, here's the thing, making that decision was all of me. But the, one of the things that, that I um, admire about her now that we've worked through all that shit over the last five years is that she knows the part she played in creating the environment where I'm going to make that decision. And one of the things about that is that people don't like this. Dave Chappelle talked about the fact that he, I love this. He's like, people know me as a bit of a victim blamer. And <laughs> what do you mean by that? Because one of the guys, he's, he's like, he always was like, well, what'd she do? 
<laughs> right. A victim blamer. I love it. <laughs> He's like, if I hear like a man cheated, he goes, I'm like, well, what did she do? Or what wasn't she doing? But we both like, that's the thing. I hate those groups like that. And I can't stand, I call people out in their bullshit. I'm like, every time a relationship fails, or I was not every time because that's an absolute, but 90 plus percent of the time when a relationship fails, both people played a role in creating the dysfunction to cause the failure. And it, that is one of the things I look for because I'm single and everybody asks that uh, every time. Like, are you single? Probably like, yeah, I'm single. But one of the things I look for and one of the questions I ask people, like, how's that last relationship? Like, you know, what happened there? And if they have no responsibility, I'm out. I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. Because I'm like, if you don't know the part you played in creating that, then we're done here. Wow. Yeah. Surprise. How many people... Literally, it's like they're not even self-aware enough to know. Like if somebody's like, well, he cheated. I'm like, okay, I get that some people just step out and cheat. That does happen. But were you not showing up in the relationship in a way that that person needed to? Um, were you say, were, were you emotionally not available to them enough? Were you not physically affectionate enough? Did you ignore their love language? Did you ignore their bids? We talked about the concept of bids. Did you consider turn outwards to their bids? Did they go to another person? not for sex. We generally don't cheat for sex. We generally cheat for emotional connection. And mm -hmm. so then when I hear about somebody cheating more times than not, it's like, boy, you weren't showing up for this person potentially in some way. And somebody's like, Oh, you're victim blaming. I'm like, okay, because I want both people to be responsible for how that circum those circumstances came about. Yeah, it's really a loving, even though this may trigger some people, like, and I have, I, in that divorce group, I, I spoke about this because I was very much in a victim mindset until I started working with Catherine Dixon, who you, <laughs> I told you all about. She's amazing. And what I, what I said is like, Hey, guess what? Like a lot of, I keep hearing of all of you, it's not all of you. Absolute. A lot of you talk about being in narcissistic relationships. Well, I definitely, definitely can relate with that. I'm telling you, you're not a victim. Like if somebody is controlling and manipulating you, what's going on with you to continue allowing that? Like what's your work that you need to do? You know, and that's was powerful. Not only like, because the victim mindset leads to misery and disempowerment. You are literally putting somebody more powerful than you. And like when somebody tells me like, oh, well, Oh, I was with this guy for three years. He was so toxic. I'm like, well, fuck, are you in it three years too? What are you talking about? Like, right. recognize there's a significant amount of toxicity, toxicity, then why didn't you exit? Right. Why, if you knew this person, you didn't have alignment with them or they were working from a source of emotional dysfunction, then why didn't you walk? Oh, he was such a good manipulator, Paul. It, he was just really good. <laughs> okay, well, start working on not being manipulated so easily. <laughs> where did where did you not speak your truth? Because that was the thing for me is whenever I, we're going all into mindset stuff, but I'm loving it because I don't know, I love this stuff. I think this is where we can, we like bodybuilding, but we like right. this stuff too. One of the things there for somebody like, well, how do I spot that? It's like one of the easiest ways to, to, to sort through that bullshit is if somebody's words and actions aren't consistently aligning, then there's manipulation that's happening at some level. And here's the thing, people will still stay in this shit because take people at face value. Just take them at what they're saying. Yes. One of the easiest things to alleviate all the confusion is your life is this person tells you something, number one, take that at face value and then weigh that against what they're doing with their actions. So if these things aren't like this, if they're like this, then you're like, okay, there's manipulation going on here and just get away. Like, I, I, like I'm not trying to be like a dick. I'm saying if you're consistently getting manipulated, then you're not showing up with a high degree of emotional EQ in this situation either. It's true. I tell my friends that all the time with their guy problems. I'm like, just believe him. He's saying he's not really ready for a relationship right now. He means that. That's what he means. There's no behind the scenes. <laughs> just believe him. <laughs> Everything to me, and you're my world, and you're all this, but you're constantly texting him, like cheating on you. Then he's lying, and you're getting manipulated. So get the fuck out. Right. Like, dumbass. I know that thing sounds like, don't be a dumbass. Like, people are like, oh, well, you're being mean. I'm like, no, okay. Some some people need to have people to be, like we said earlier, need to be mean to them and say, you are being a dumbass. So this person, if they're telling you like, oh, I love you and you're my whole world, there's nobody but you or whatever, but you've consistently caught them texting other women or cheating or whatever you're doing, then guess what? That's called lies. That means that you're being manipulated because the words and actions aren't congruent. This right. is not that hard. Okay. This is not that hard. Yeah. And this is something I just had this conversation with my kids yesterday about this victimization mindset. Cause kids do this, right? Kids are like, 
they hit someone, then somebody hits them back and they're a victim, right? They're like, I just wanted the remote and he hit me or whatever it is, you know? And I'm like, what, once they go into that victim mindset, then they are in misery. Now they're in misery. Now they're in there crying in their room. Everyone's against me. And it's like, hold on. As soon as I call them on their BS, I'm like, what did you do? What could you have done differently there? All of a sudden the crying stops. So it actually brings us into a place of empowerment and happiness when we own our crap. <laughs> or the, when, like I said, uh, not to, to recycle the discussion, but when I went through, uh, when I went through, had the affair and, and like basically lost my family, the, the first step that I took that I knew to like basically changing my life, like for the better again, was ownership. I was like, like I had to stop blaming everyone around me and go, okay, um, it's not really anybody's fault but mine. So, and I know you went through a similar thing. We don't mm-hmm. have names, but I know like there was a, you were time like, well, this person manipulated me and had mm-hmm. me. And then at the end, the only way you step out of that is go, no, I really made all those decisions. Yep. 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 And it's a tough, tough, most um, delicious pill to swallow. It is the most, it's like, looks so hard to swallow. But once you do, you're like, oh my gosh, this is way better. <laughs> That's true. Because here's the thing. It's like, once you actually wake up and you say, I created this catastrophe, you'll also come to the realization at some point, you're like, okay, but then I can rebuild it and undo it. So right. It really is an empowering thing because you can say, despite the fact that I, I actually hauled in did this metric ass load of bullshit into my life, I actually still have the ability to take that same shovel and actually haul it out and clean the place and make it look nice, you know, and fancy it up. So when you actually start taking responsibility for your like your, your current situation and your perception about life, then you also realize, oh, I had the absolute power to change all those things too. But you can't have one without the other. You can't just show up and go, oh, well, these people did all these things to me. Like one of my phrases that I hate the most is that you made me feel like, oh, oh, oh you will not. You, I don't let nope. people use that phrase on me. You will nope. not. Let people try to do that. You made me feel, uh, uh, yo, I'll stop them right there. You, uh, uh, you don't get to tell me I made you feel. I don't get that much power in your life. I'll take that power away from you. I'm like, you don't get right. to tell me I made you feel. So Yeah. Yeah. These are all like very, like, it's crazy. These are very like basic things that we should have learned as kids, but we didn't, you know, we didn't learn these things. That's the thing. What I think is the opposite. I think we unlearn them. I mm. think we unlearn so much of this stuff as we get older. I think we actually truly unlearn. Like, for example, we learn things like racism or prejudice. We, we learn, we learn those things, but I think that we unlearn how to love each other. I think we unlearn certain degrees of empathy. And I think it comes back later through experience, right? I think mm-hmm. we can, positions in life where we become potentially cynical or jaded because of bad stuff that happens to us. And then we have to have that awakening moment where we actually have to become, we have to become that more, um, before the world got a hold of that inner child, right? Before the world got a hold of that and created those wounds and scars. It's like, it's more like a, it's not like a fun, like a finding yourself. It's more like a rediscovering process of, of, of just saying, oh, I was just, I buried who I really was underneath all those layers. Mm-hmm. So just peel away all these layers yes. and stories that the world told me about me that I accepted without challenging. Yep. And have to go back to really, it's more like an innocence. Absolutely. This I talk about this all the time with my ladies that I coach. It's just that we got these big old onions. We're just walking around inside of an onion and we're like a freaking diamond in there. Just peel, 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 peel until you can shine out and show who you really are. I definitely relate with that. Like all that, like I call it being plugged into the matrix. Like for me, it was religion and education system and all these things. And like have the big, you know, big yard with the house and the boat and the perfect life and the garden and the perfect fire pit area and all the, all the things, you know, have the cookies after school. Like I was trapped in this onion that wasn't even who I was. I didn't really want to be living any of that life. And so- it's not really, I, I, I've consistently found as I've gone through this, uh, the, 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 the walk of self-discovery, it's really not about finding yourself. It's really about an uncovering process of getting yes. all the bullshit that either you've told yourself or that you've allowed the world, the stories the world has created about you that you just accepted without ever challenging. And so it's the more like, uh, it, it's, um, yeah, it's just an, an it's a, it's the right word, like an, an uncovering. It's an, it's a peeling away the layers of all that stuff. And you're like, oh, I was in there the whole time. I was just not even accessing my true self on a day-to-day basis. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's such, I love that you called that. Um, I wrote this down the walk of self-discovery. That's what, that's what, that's what we're talking about here is the walk of self-discovery. And I have to ask you this because I, I feel like you're a principles person. Like you're always looking for true principles, right? Cause that helps you when you're writing, that helps you with these things. Do you feel like lifting weights has helped you discover a lot of true principles in life? Yeah, I mean, definitely going back to um, I think one of one of the, the the early things that I discovered very early early on was that it was something um, that the more uncomfortable that I made myself and the more I stretched myself, you know, it's like that soreness, like the the concept of creating like a parallel between that and say like self awareness or personal growth is that emotional growth is really painful man you have to confront a lot of really painful truths about who you are the way you behave, the choices that you make the way you speak um the stories that you tell yourself all of that and re undoing that is so can be so because we develop over the years um and keep me redirected back to that because i would draw the parallel but we over the years we will consistently create coping mechanisms in some way emotionally that allows us to survive you know, otherwise we would just go into a nervous breakdown over and over when we have very traumatic events happen to us. So over the years, we create coping mechanisms. Sometimes they're healthy and sometimes they're unhealthy and it all depends. But when you get into, and you and I talked about this, when you get into cyclical patterns in your life where the outcomes are not what you really want, it means that we're going back to these unhealthy coping mechanisms that are recreating those stories over and over again. So for me, what I found the parallel that exists there is that when lifting weights, if you go into the gym and you just do a little bit of stuff and whatever, you can't expect that your body's going to go, Oh, let me adapt to that. And the adaptation, which is muscle growth because it wants to protect itself um, from further onslaughts of that type of stress. (laughs) So in order for us to become more emotionally resilient, we have to stretch ourselves into really uncomfortable places so that when we get pushed off emotional center, when we're flooded, when we feel triggered or whatever, we we can feel that we're still going to feel those things. That's a, the part about personal growth people, a lot of people don't get. It's like that it never goes away for a lot of people. It's like this is still going to trigger me, but the difference is now I'm really strong mm-hmm. and I can stay centered and I can walk myself into the outcomes that I want in these situations, right? Yep. Yep. And we, we, we still fail at that at times, just like we still miss PRs in the gym, right? Like I want to hit this weight and we, we don't get it. You know, we're not quite there yet. But then later we keep training, we keep training, we keep training, we keep doing the things that we know are the right things to do to get us to those places. And then we hit that PR. And I see emotional growth as being really similar in that as long as you consistently are challenging yourself in the right kind of ways and you're like, I want these new outcomes in my life. I don't want to keep mm-hmm. repeating dysfunctional cyclical patterns that I have where I'm miserable for months at a time. And as long as you're doing the discipline and the work and you get um, um, that stress is put in front of you again, like, Oh, I'm pushed off center. And I've had that plenty of times over the past few years. It's really a cool thing for people who haven't experienced it. When you feel yourself get flooded and you feel yourself flooded and you're like, not, not today, Satan. You'd like, <laughs> feel it right like you still feel it but you're like you literally and i you have that little click in your mind that goes what do what outcome do i want from this situation like what do i want to get out of this situation that is one of the most powerful feelings you can feel in your life and for anybody who hasn't felt that they do not know the internal power that has it's like if, if you were setting a world record like in a lift or something right like that's the only way i can imagine there's like when you hit your personal best in the gym and how empowering that feels in that moment when you get in those situations of stress like that emotional stress um and you feel that same energy that you that hurts and is painful and whatever but you can hold it right you can sit in it and you can be like I'm going to connect with this person. I'm going to empathize with what they're dealing with because they're hurting me because they're hurt right now too. And I'm going to say, talk to me about why this is bothering you so much right now. And you can walk yourself into that new outcome. That's one of the most awesome things in the world. And for Absolutely. People, I have not immersed themselves in those particular, like I said, that personal walk of self-development. When you hit those situations and you're able to do that, man, that feels amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. I call this stay in the sucky. I tell my clients that all the time. I say that on social, I'm like, stay in the sucky just a little bit longer. That's where all the growth is happening. That little sucky, uncomfortable moment. I would not use that phrase, but that's me. But I like, I love it. I like it. Like, I like, like stay where it's hard. Right. Yeah. 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 But 
Yeah, that's me. I stay in the sucky moment. You know that moment when you just like you don't want to do anymore. You're like, oh my gosh, I just can't do it anymore. Stay it's there just a little bit longer. Hard because like when you feel that that when you feel flooded or you feel triggered, you, you immediately want to go back to those old reactionary habits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's like the old thing, like oh, let me be super reactionary right now. And, mm, 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 mm. and mm-hmm. then later, when you come back down, because you always do. Later, when you come back down, you're like, mm, I wish I would have talked that. Way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yep. And it's just like our bodies, our bodies do the same thing. It's like, no, 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 no. Let me, you know, I I was out there. You were helping me with my hip stuff because my right adductor loves to take over for my right glute. And every, I've been working on it since I got back and it's, it's still there. The easy route for me, the easy reaction is, oh, this is hard. Adductor, adductor says, I got it. Don't worry. And it's that very uncomfortable, like rehab. It feels like rehab and emotionally it feels like rehab too. When you change, it's like, no, this is not going to be easy. We're not going to go fast. It's not going to get done quickly. Like we're going to slow down. We're going to change and we're going to stay in that little bit uncomfortable moment. It's the same thing with the body and, and our, and our spirits. Like we just want to react in the same way that we always have. But if we're willing to slow down and be like, hold on, hold on, hold on, let me stop time. And I'd love what you're saying about the outcomes. What is the outcome that I want from this situation? Cause you can tell any story you want about the situation. We, what, what reality to us is the story that we're telling about any given situation. So no. I love yeah, that's totally the other thing that I had to that you have to often challenge, right? Is like your cognitive um, your cognitive bias in situations because when you're still working from a place of being, uh, and if there's any one thing, because there's so many parts that we hit on here, but definitely one of the strongest parts is that we we live so strongly in our cognitive bias about situations and things we believe. And a lot of times, and I dated a girl like this, she, I had to be a particular way because she had had some really shitty relationships before me. She would end up trying to manifest those situations and that behavior out of me because she, I had to be that guy. I had to be this kind of guy. And I'm like, I see what you're doing. I'm like, I'm not going to work. I'm like, I'm not going to react the way that you, she needed me to be this certain way. She needed to create this situation. And I'm like, I'm not that's not me. And I know what you're doing. So one of the other thing about doing enough of this stuff is that you start to spot these behaviors and people are like, Hey, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah. We talked about this. We talked because we were talking about all of our dating relationships while I was out there and, and it was like, Oh, you have all these people. And it's like, Oh, so close. And what we do is we put on these rose colored glasses sometimes and we're like, okay, they have all these things that are really great, but I just need them to be like this and this way. And we, <laughs> You were like cracking me up because you were like, please, please just be this one other way. <laughs> That's what we do, right? You're like, oh, yes, they do have it. You're just like, That's that one out of 10 behavior patterns. And, uh, but I mean, even the negative. T- so people wonder why. Um, and this was the other one that I like I try to touch on is that people will say things like, all men are cheaters or like all women are crazy or all like everybody dates a narcissist or whatever. And what they don't often realize is, well, there's a couple of factors there is that they're not doing a very good job of prioritizing or even knowing what their real needs in a partner are. And then the other thing is, is that somewhere along the line, we, most people end up with a pretty significant enough emotional injury in their life um, that it causes like some type of, um, like that's the dysfunction they end up working out of too often. And they end up with this subconscious belief that in some way, shape or form, they deserve what happened to them. So they will end up a lot of times working from that framework in their life that I deserve to be cheated on, or I'm not worth a good love or whatever, because of all that, because there's a, there's a, a, thing, a number of things that cascade off of the emotionally, that cascade off of that, that event happening. So then what happens is, they, when they set out in these particular relationships, their cognitive bias that I, that this person is going to be this way and they're going to do this thing to me because I deserve it. And that's all I'm worth. They often end up recreating those situations yep. with people through their own behavior. And they're not often aware. And that's why they say, oh, all men are cheaters or all men are this or there. Because there's a couple of things happening there. Um, is that's number one, they don't really know what they're looking for in a partner. You and I talk, mm-hmm. we, we, we challenge each other on this things like mm-hmm. so What's your, what's your top three? And people don't realize once you start really getting challenged by the right kind of person mm-hmm. on what your top, top things that you need in somebody are, you don't realize, holy shit, I've been finding people based on stuff that no wonder all my relationships fell apart. Right. So you have to have somebody smart enough to kind of guide you to what it really is that's important to you. Um, and then the second thing is, is that you have to become self-aware enough to know that when you're trying to recreate some of those shitty situations in your life through your own words and behavior, and that's why I said words are so important because how you talk to yourself, um, how you right. talk to 
person is so powerful to create those situations. So, and full circle, it comes back to when we're feeling particular things like, oh, I'm feeling this way, challenge that feeling and say, is this feeling really true? And why am I telling myself this story again all over? Yeah. But if you spend some real time, man, going through the mud and getting stretched out and having some expensive lessons that you end up learning through all that kind of stuff and that you're really, really like, I don't really want this shit in my life anymore. you got to arrive at a place where you're like, I don't want these outcomes in my life anymore. And I know this is going to suck for a while, but I really want better. Yeah. It's a hard place for people to come through because they can say it. What are you doing to change it? And when they're not, they don't work with a therapist or a coach or they don't read any books or do anything. I'm like, well, you, you don't really fucking want to change. You just want to bitch and moan in victim mode and say, well, I want something different, but you're not doing anything different. It's like the person at the job waits their job, but they're not willing to, you know, file out, you know, fill out applications for another job or get an education or, or, or you know, go take courses that give them the opportunity to do something different. There's got to be that words and actions that got to be congruent again, mm-hmm. got to be congruent again, or you're just manipulating yourself and lying to yourself. self betrayal is like, I'm going to wake up every day. Oh, I want these, all these things. I do want them. I really want them. I'm doing nothing. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. I always say people want astronomical results with very little effort. Life doesn't work like that. I was actually listening to Think and Grow Rich last night while I was putting laundry away and doing all that stuff for Sunday nights are kind of my, my like just personal growth time. And I love that book, Think and Grow Rich. That book is so enlightened. It's not even funny. It's not just about money. It's such an enlightened book. And one of the things that he was talking about is that we all have these fears. We have these deep fears, but most people don't have the courage to even, to even admit that they have these deep fears. Like you admitting your, um, when I was, I did a, a live with uh, Jordan Sy, um, Jordan coaches Gary B like in training and stuff. And one of the things that he and I talked about, I said, um, one of the things that you do, you do to initially empower yourself over your insecurities is simply admit them. They like speak them out loud because it's so weird. As soon as you start speaking them out loud, it's, they kind of start, to, they do start to dissipate and you're like, it doesn't mean they'll fully go away forever because if that was if it was that easy, there'd be no therapists out there and work. But the fact that you're going to be open enough um, to admit that you have an insecurity because we all do. And I really hate when people cash the gate and criticize other people for insecurity. I'm like, but you yeah. got them. So shut up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we all have them. Right. But the way that we get better um, if we don't want them, because sometimes you can have insecurity you're like, that's fine. I'm good. <laughs> There's certain things I don't give a shit about. You have to decide what the outcome that you want in your life. But if you if you have an insecurity, the way to, to start empowering yourself over particular insecurities is just simply to say what they are. Like, right. and that's really difficult for people to do because then they're like, oh, you're going to see me as a terrifically flawed human. I'm like, dude, I already know that. So just say what they are and let's, let's, let's unpack this shit. There's nothing that may, one of my friends just opened up to me this morning about one of her deep insecurities that I had no idea about. What do you think that did? It made me love her like 10 times more. I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you for telling me that. Like we think, we think that it's going to make people love us less. It's such a ridiculous concept. We, it makes you love people more when we can open up and show our vulnerabilities. Okay. I want to twist the conversation real quick. I want to turn. I love this. This is great. I'm like, well, if we could go all day about mindset stuff, we actually have gone all day about mindset stuff, <laughs> but I want to twist a little bit because could you please use your like no BS self and explain to people like, what are the, what are the things that you feel like people are missing? Cause everybody, you know, bodybuilding, I feel like doesn't get enough credit sometimes because like we learn so much about human, like body composition and the human metabolism from bodybuilding out of necessity. It's like, well, we got to figure this out so we can get the results that we want. So most people, I don't think they realize I'm like, oh, so you want to look like a bodybuilder. Okay. So you want to look like a bodybuilder. You want muscle and you want to be lean. Okay. So, so let, how do we like kind of dumb this down, I guess, for the average person that's listening, like, and they're like, I want to build muscle and I want to lose body fat. What do you feel like are the key things that they need to understand? Um, from a dietary aspect, the one thing that I, I, I try to basically pound consistently is the fact that there's there's no special there's no special superior diet. So somebody and that that's the one that I really consistently try to tell people there's no superior diet. In every study that we've ever seen in the meta analysis um, that was done looking at all named diets, whatever the name of the diet is, whether it's like you know Atkins or whether it's you know keto or whether it's um, you know, the Mediterranean diet or whether it's, you know, what would it be, uh, you know, whether it's paleo or whatever it is, mm-hmm. what name diet, when you match calorie intake and protein intake, then they all work function pretty similarly if you're in a calorie deficit. 
So if anybody's out there and they're looking for a special diet, and this is me coming from, I just released my carb cycling book two weeks ago. I'll still tell you, I'm like, okay, it's, if you adhere to the carb cycling, um, the reason why it works for a lot of people is because it's not linear cycling. And some people don't like linear cycling, right? So mm-hmm. what diet that you use that you just feel like, Hey, I can do this because whatever reason it kind of just speaks to you. I've just kind of found that there's intangibles here. You can't always find some people like keto. Like I told you, like, I didn't like keto. I did keto and I did, I was hungry as shit all the time. Like I had terrible energy levels. Like it did the opposite for me that other people that end up loving keto says it, it does for them. Now that's the part about using a diet that everybody um, has to kind of, they're going to be their own scientists at the end of the day, right? The individual yeah. the needs of the individual matter too. So, yeah. but the one thing I try to tell people when it comes to diet is that if you want to lose fat, that's generally what we're talking about more times than not. If you, if fat loss is super important, there's no spectacular diet. That's just outshining all the others. There's not and people that keto people get mad or paleo people get mad. Like I've consistently used low fat diets over the years because I like eating that way and I do well with them. And I've gotten shredded plenty of times. I stay lean all year round doing it. And so the main thing is that, and people go, what do you mean? Like when you equate calories and protein. So if you're eating 2000 calories a day and that puts you in a calorie deficit for fat loss, let's say you're eating 180 grams of protein. It doesn't matter what you do with your carbs and your fat in those 2000 calories. So you have the 2000 calories, 180 grams of protein, your fats and your carbohydrates, you just use those according to your preference. So it doesn't matter what happens if one goes up, one goes down, or you do this or whatever, or they're even or whatever. All this is the same. It's going to work the same in the end if your calories and your protein are, are equated for. So in other words, 2,000 calories here with 180 grams of protein with really low carbs and higher fat. 2,000 calories here with 108 grams of protein, with low fat, higher carbs, they're going to work essentially the same over time for fat loss. Um, that's just every, everything we've seen in every study has shown that consistently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing about nutrition I tell people, you need, if it's fat loss, get your, your calories dialed in, get your protein dialed in, and then just massage your, your carbs and your fat according to what feels like you can have a high degree of compliance in that diet. Mm-hmm. So that's simple. That's yeah, that's simple, but I feel like I'm, I'm explaining that as simple as I can. Yeah. That's, I was going to say that's beautifully simplistic and I, that I like what you hit on there. Cause my, all my approach, you know, my keto and out all keto in and out, all of this stuff is kind of choose your own adventure, find what works for you. Like people get into this mindset of, Oh, this is good. And this is bad. Like we get indoctrinated like a gospel and it's like, is it working for you? Is it giving you the intended result? Can you continue doing this? Do you like it? Right? Like instead of just being like, well, this really sucks for me, but I guess I'm just not doing it right. Let me feel defeated because so-and-so Janet (laughs) down the street, did it and it worked for her. So I don't know what's wrong with me. It's like, ah, come on now. A really good anecdotal, like evidence. Like I put this girl, this was years and years. It was probably 15 years ago. I don't know how long this was, but girl I worked with and I put her on a low carb diet, like pretty close to keto ish. She came to me, she needed to lose a lot of weight. She came to me after like, I think it was like a week and a half, 10 days. Yeah. A week and a half, maybe two weeks. She's like, I cannot do this. She's like, I can't, this is terrible. And then I switched everything around and I gave her a low fat, high carb diet, protein match, calories match. This before I even knew on the study, but I knew that was important. She, I didn't see her again because we worked at different times, but she showed up in my house one day. She, she literally lived a block away. She showed up in my house one day, six months later and had lost like 40 pounds. And she couldn't do the other diet for two weeks. It just like her complaint. She's like, I'm craving stuff all the time. I can't stay on it. I don't like eating this way. That's really important. I it is. Like do it. Don't freaking do it. There's a, there's a million other ways that you can manipulate your macros. Right. You know? at, like at, don't get stuck in this dogma that, you know, but I don't care if, if a million people did keto, which they have and lost weight, but you can't do it. If, it doesn't mean the diet is bad or good. It just means like for you, it just isn't resonating with you from either. It could be some like your ghrelin hormone, or your leptin, right? a multitude of things that you don't know that are going on. But either way, the point is it's just not working for you. 
Yeah, absolutely. I want my audience to hear this so much. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm the most like anti keto keto coach there is because it doesn't. This is this is what people I feel like fail to understand is they fail to listen to themselves and trust themselves and say, "Hey, is this working for me?" Because that's while I've had life changing transformations on keto. Like people are like, "I love this." Like I'm getting texts every day. I love this. I love this. Like I've never been able to have anything work like this. This is so amazing. And I have other people that is not like that for them. That they're like, "Dude, I don't know. This is not my." Jam, you know, and so honoring that it's what, what, that's what I want everyone to understand. Cause I feel like as social media grows in the fitness world, it's getting very dogmatic. It's like, it's almost like joining a cult or a culture and that's not helping anyone. It's always been that way. The one thing it's, that, <laughs> it's always been that way. I've, the one of the things I do, I try to be um, very cognizant of is the fact that I, um, the basis of the information that I put out is consistently um, coming from a place of what we're seeing um, in the evidence-based community. And sometimes I have to use that word because evidence-based does not mean I read the abstract from a study on PubMed, so now I know. I'm like, okay, <laughs> abstracts, on study, uh, abstracts of a study on PubMed is not evidence-based. The evidence-based community revolves around peer-reviewed research, revolves around the needs of the individual, and then what we're seeing coming out of the field by coaches. So it's all of those things. It's a multitude of layers that end up creating the evidence base, what we consider science. It's not one thing. So that is kind of like every, the majority of things. Um, I, there's, there's stuff that I consider like bro science that I know works just because I've used it on so many clients. Mm -hmm. um, like my car cycling book came out a couple of weeks ago. There's, we don't have a lot of um, peer reviewed research looking at nonlinear diets, but all of the principles that I built the diet around come they're they're evidence-based they're scientifically based um mm -hmm. that's why like, what makes your diet better than the others i'm like nothing like it's like but if it, if it some like my car cycling will work a lot better for some people who just like that approach so i would tell you this is a, a preference in approaches so like some people go i love keto you gotta do keto or i love paleo you do or i love the zone diet or whatever i'm like okay that's cool so use them right like, okay if it works for you then use it if you had to have a high degree of compliance using that that's your diet there you go that's it. Well said. Well said. Okay. What about, what about training? What about training? What do you think holds people back in training, getting their muscular gains? That's easy effort. Like that's <laughs> it. Like John Meadows and I, I don't know if your crowd knows who John Meadows is. John is like one of the most respected and revered guys in the bodybuilding community. He's considered like the Mr. Rogers of the bodybuilding community, mm -hmm. which is he and I are like, he's like my brother. Uh, we've been really close friends for a long time. Cause I'm, I, I'd be like the Darth Vader, I guess. So for, <laughs> But uh, John's like the, uh, yeah, he's like the Mr. Rogers. And uh, <laughs> everybody loves John. There's nobody yes. else in the world that does not like really love John Meadows. He had a heart attack like a month ago or something. And just there was a meltdown across the whole bodybuilding community. Like, please don't let John Meadows die. Everybody mm -hmm. loves He is an amazing human being. Um, but John and I, we train together tons of times. We've made, he's, you know, we've made YouTube videos together. People can go check those out. We talk about this all the time. If there's any one shortcoming with why people aren't reaching their goals is you do not fucking train hard enough. You are with me out here. You see how like I train there's, like, oh, well, yeah. there's not, a, there's another, not another ounce. Like there, you can't, another rep can't be done. There's no movement left. That's how each set's performed. And hey, let, let me just say real quick, let me interject. When Paul trains, what he's not on his phone. He's not even talking. We don't talk. We, uh, we like to talk. No talking. It's nope. all focus. And it's like every the rep the, towards the end of every set, it's like, oh, there's no way he's going to get another rep. Oh my gosh, he did. There's no freaking way he's going to get another rep. Oh my gosh, he did. That's training intensely. So just thought I'd throw right. that in there. Yeah, that's one of the things that I try to emphasize people. And now there's a lot of people say, well, there's research shows you don't have to train to failure. I'm like, okay. But I had Brad Schoenfeld when I was doing my own podcast. I had Brad on my own po podcast and he talked about that. He's like, there's, there's at some point, there's just no getting away from the fact that you're going to have to do some drop sets, some supersets. You're going to have to train really brutally hard because your body's going to become adapted to all the shit you're throwing at it. So somebody's like, oh, well, I go to the gym. I've been going to the gym for so many months and I haven't seen progress. And then when I watch them train, I'm like, you aren't even doing like your sets, the sets that you think are you working out aren't even, I wouldn't even call them warm up sets. They're like warm, <laughs> they're warm ups for warm ups. And so when I see people, like if, how many, like if they, one of the things that, uh, I don't know if this is your time scientific for like some of your craft, because I know that 
I get a lot of people that don't understand a lot of these concepts, but there's a concept called reps and reserves. So let's say you pick a weight that if you know you did as many reps as you could to where you could not do another single rep at all, that's called failure. And you have, you do, you could do 10 reps like that to where you could never do an 11th rep, no matter how hard you try. A lot of people train what I call, they do, they have too many reps in reserve. So they'll take that weight and instead of doing the full 10 to like complete value where they could do 11, they'll do like six reps. And I'm like, you're too far away from muscular fail, muscular failure to create the stimulus that's needed mm-hmm. for the, um, for the body to go, Oh, I've got to do some muscle remodelings and grow thicker, larger muscles in order to have adaptation for this stress. So if there's anyone challenged and like I launched my, um, my, app, my own, my own line training application the last few days. And one of the things I'm excited about that is because there's videos of me in their training. And I'm like, this is how you have to train if you want to grow. And women are like, well, I don't want to be a big bulky brand. Like, you're not going to be shut the fuck up. You're not going to be there's dudes out there that don't look like dudes that want to look like dudes that go into the gym and don't look like dudes because it's hard to grow muscle. But if you want that body, that new reshaped body, like yep. you have to grow muscle. Okay. And women are not, when they're like, I don't want to be this big, bulky, blah. I'm like, you're not a man. You don't have enough testosterone to do that. Okay. So just shut up, <laughs> go into the gym and train really hard. And if you want that, butt, well, you should know this, like you're going to have to go the biomechanics for it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but and you want the legs and you I want some toned arms and all that shit. Do you know what tone is? It's muscle growth. It's, it's growing muscle. It's hypertrophy. So if you want those toned arms and you want that big slam and booty and you want all of those hamstrings, and you want all that kind of stuff, you've got to train really hard to create muscle growth. There's got to be an adaptation. There's got to be create, uh, create a, 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 a more degree, higher degree of muscle proteins. There's got to be more muscle proteins, which is thicker, denser muscle fibers. So that has to happen. The only way that can happen is there's got to be a stress that is strong enough. Think about this. I always tell people, you're telling your body to grow muscle. It doesn't want to do that. Right. Or trying to get your body to do something it doesn't want to do because muscle is metabolically really expensive. So you're trying to tell your body, add this shit on that you don't want. <laughs> So right. in order to grow muscle, you have got to give your body a stimulus strong enough to do something it doesn't necessarily want to do. It's not, it's not, it doesn't make life more efficient. Right. Creating that actual functional tissue. Like it goes, no, dude, I just want you to be able to walk around and run and pick some shit up here and there and like feed yourself. Like, yep. like, no, I want you to grow muscle so I can. I can support my joints better so I can be stronger so I can have denser, uh, 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 I can create bone density. Uh, you know, like mm-hmm. it comes all those benefits. But if you want that sexy body, I'm supposed to tell people, and it's okay to be as a man, I want a sexy body too. But if you want that sexy body, then you've got to train with a stimulus that is strong enough that your body goes, oh shit, I need some, I need some muscle mass to, to deal with this. So how, ask yourself this, if you are actually asking your body to, add on more muscle tissue, how hard do you have to train to get it to do that? Do you think going in and doing a couple of squats, you know, where you're 20 reps, you know, reps in reserve where you're doing like, Oh, I, I did, I did 20, 20 squats with like, like negative 14 pounds. I'm like, okay, probably nothing's going to happen. So right. you've, got, you've got to challenge yourself. I always tell people this, if you want a new body, especially for intermediates or a lot of women that you end up listening and you want a new body, Whatever weights that you're using right now, those need to be your warm up weights six months yep. from then. And then six months from then, whatever weights that you're using need to be your warm ups from then. You need to be crushing your weights and reps every few months, like what you were doing. So yeah. I had to have this talk with a guy, it was a, it was a guy that was the entertainment um, director out of like Fox, New York, and he didn't understand the concept of progressive overload. And that's what that is. So he didn't understand the simple concept of progressive overload. I said, okay, listen, dude, if you're squatting, he's like, I want bigger legs. I'm like, but you're weak as shit. I'm like, you won't have bigger legs because you haven't asked your legs to grow. So he was literally can only squat. Like it was like 155 pounds for 10 reps. I go, well, let me ask you a really simple question. If you can only squat 155 for 10 reps right now, if you got to the point where you could squat 400 for 20, do you think your legs would be freaking huge? He's like, yeah. I'm like, it's that simple. It's right. Simple. Right. Yeah. This is, I, I actually had a client in from out of town yesterday and I trained with her 
And I pushed her, I pushed her really hard. She had good form. And I, I told her like, I have found that when people get to the point where they're going to stop, that's where they, that's when they just started. I'm like, everything else is just priming the pump, like priming a, a freaking lawnmower. Like all these reps that you did to get to this point where you're like, oh shit, oh shit. That's where you start. <laughs> you start it. Oh shit. Right. That's where growth is starting to happen. And what I found is, you know, when I, I see this all the time, training people in person, they're like, they're, they're mentally, they're freaking out, but they're still going full range through reps. They're not even, they're not even close to the partials yet. And they're ready to quit. They're like, Oh my gosh, they're swearing, you know? And I'm like, you're not even close to done. You're still going through a full rep right now. Way I have a litmus test for that for, especially for dudes. Um, women actually have a higher threshold for pain than the women I've cons- or than men. I've consistently found that cause you guys have good childbirth. You've had mm-hmm. that. It's just mm-hmm. a built in thing. So, um, a hundred rep barbell curls, empty bar. I tell dudes, grab it, do a hundred reps. And the majority of them can't do a hundred. Now they have the strength through the strength endurance to do a hundred, but they mentally, they can't push through the pain. And I've actually done over 200. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but it's just a mental thing. It's right. a mental thing. Like how can I, can I push through this pain? So that like the, the part of it is like being able to push yourself into those new areas. Um, and people that I've had and come train with me long enough that have, that didn't do that before. They're like, um, one of the girls I dated that started training with me, trained for a long time. Like she saw more results in like two months than she had seen in all the years previously combined because she was training harder than she had ever trained. And she couldn't believe how fast her body changed. She's like, holy shit. Like her body was changing daily. Yeah. She was training that hard and she had right. never trained really hard before. And so when you train really hard, like I said, when you have that, that, that stress is high enough that the body is just forced to make changes, you'll see changes happen really fast. So the people are like, oh, I haven't, like my body, it won't blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, you just don't train very hard. But when they start training very hard, they're surprised at how fast their body's like, no, I got you. I'll, I'll do this for you. And then the other thing, so that number one is, is like training hard enough. That's always almost the number one thing. It, it's the people get, well, how many days a week, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm like if you start with just training really hard, a lot of the stuff just to start working itself out. Mm-hmm. I would say that's the number one to keep it simple. And then the other one is something that we talked about when you were here as, um, is, um, and this is probably too in depth or complex that we could get into. Um, but I'm just, I'm just going to kind of needle you about it because we had to have that <laughs> conversation was that, um, training with too much. I feel like I feel, how do I feel this in my muscles? <laughs> and I'm like, car, that is not how this works. And mm-hmm. you, but, but show me. And then when you, it, you had a light bulb moment too, in the training, you're like, when you're, you could feel your glutes were like exhausted, but you never felt them actually working mm-hmm. what were doing. And you were walking across the floor like, wow, I feel my glutes. Yeah. But you never felt them yeah. while you doing your squats, right? Like you didn't right. feel nothing to feel, but when you, when you were just walking, you could feel that they were fatigued. When you did the lunges, you felt that they were fatigued. And that's right. what I, Okay, it's mechanical. You that tension. You need tension, and tension doesn't feel like a crampy contraction. Right. People are always working towards that. Well, I don't feel that in that muscle. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, executing appropriately, tension doesn't feel like what a lot of trainers like. Do you feel that? Like, do you have this strong contraction, crampy contraction in that muscle right there? I just want to punch those trainers in the face. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not tension. We want a high degree of tension in the movements that we do. And that mechanical tension is consistently proved over and over to be the catalyst for driving muscle growth. And like you can't get to a high degree of mechanical tension without effort. So all of these things go back full circle. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Like you're, um, you're saying, yeah, of course I feel it sometimes, but that's not what I'm going for. I'm going for the tension. So that's, that was a great thing that I've been thinking about a lot since I left too. So thank you for that. Yeah. And anytime you get those, and that's what I try to emphasize. I was like, all right, Tara, if you were outside doing yard work and you got these crampy contractions, every mm-hmm. time you're like raking or just doing this, you're like, what is wrong with my body? I'm like, so why, when you come into the gym, why are you trying to get that? Mm-hmm. Like, not normal. And right. Like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I love that analogy. It's great. It, it's fantastic. And I love guys, this, these concepts, you guys need to go follow Paul on social. So he's lift, run, bang, lift, run, bang on Instagram. And then on Facebook, I don't know. Can people follow you on Facebook? Yeah. Um, no, not on no, Facebook, sorry I guys. Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> um, I just and, use Facebook to stir the pot anymore. Like my, <laughs> you're going to find my educational content. My Facebook is more for, uh, uh, more for me, like interacting with people in a fun way. Uh, yeah. Um, 
What about, uh, where can they find your carb cycling program? Uh, so if you go to my Instagram, that's become like my home for everything. I had some, it's the link in my bio. Okay, and great. An heroic program in there, I'm carb cycling in there. So literally if you want to change your body over the next six months, you can get the carb cycling book. You can sign up for train heroic and then I'll be doing coaching out of there. I'm really excited about the whole concept of it because um, I ran coaching groups for years out of Facebook groups and did recon groups and got phenomenal results with this carb cycling approach and then teaching people, you know, everything like about their, how do you use biomechanics to um, uh, like exercise selection and tempo and exercise movement syntax and all these things, all of these things matter. So people say, well, you're overthinking stuff. I'm like, well, I want to be as efficient as possible. And then I want people to be as efficient as possible with the time that they spend in, in, uh, in the gym. So all these concepts do matter if that stuff's important to you. Yeah, absolutely, guys. So go to Lift Run Bang on Instagram, and we'll we'll link it here, and you can find all of that in the link in this bio. I um, if you just search for actually Paul Carter, literally on Google or anywhere, I actually come up first now. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I did search you. So yeah, you'll you'll find him there on Google as well. So Paul, thank you so much for sharing your heart and your soul and your knowledge. It's been amazing. Right. Appreciate you. Me on, yeah, absolutely appreciate you too.